it's uh, really a, a pleasure to introduce uh, Malcolm Knight. Uh, he he's a distinguished fellow at CG, uh, and his uh, uh, career really uh, summarizes what CG stands for, what CG is for. Um, Malcolm is uh, an economist. Uh, he studied at the uh, London School of Economics, where he's a visiting professor. And he had a very uh, accomplished career in the, uh, both national and the international uh, policymaking sector. Uh, he was a staff economist, a senior staff economist of the IMF in the earlier part of his career. Then he became uh, a senior deputy governor of the Bank of Canada, acting as a chief operating officer of the same institution. And then from Ottawa, he went to uh, Basel, where he was a general manager and CEO of the Bank of International Settlements. Uh, and then from uh, uh, Basel, he uh, moved to the private sector, where he was uh, a deputy chairman of Deutsche Bank, uh, mainly uh, you know, overseeing uh, the regulatory aspects of, uh, uh, this very important, uh, of this very important bank. And uh, uh, from Deutsche Bank, uh, a few months ago, uh, he, we are so proud and happy that he decided to join CG, where, as I said, he currently is a distinguished fellow. Um, so turning to uh, Malcolm's uh, keynote address today, uh, whose title is uh, uh, Calm and Crisis in uh, um, Global uh, Finance, uh, essentially, uh, from uh, you know the way I see it, is a sort of smooth continuation from our uh, you know discussion uh, that we had uh, earlier on in the panel, uh, uh, except that the uh, angle you know is is, is shifting a little bit. So uh, you know uh, at at the session we had um, we were talking about uh, the uh, need for legal systems, national legal system to adapt to international financial uh, regulatory initiatives. We we're talking about uh, um, um, you know, the, um, how international monetary cooperation can take place if central banks ought to be accountable to national governments. Here the uh, angle, the standpoint uh, shifts completely and uh, uh, looks at really the global governance of financial regulation. So as uh, Malcolm uh, you know, implicitly stated in his question to the panel, he said, uh, uh, well, how should we structure the governance of uh, global financial regulation? Because what we see as uh, emerged from the global crisis is a sort of bimodal structure. So on the one hand, we have uh, the IMF uh, with its own features, its own mandate. On the other, we have the FSB. Uh, and then we have also, uh, of course, the G20, which provides a sort of overarching, albeit imperfect, uh, um, you know, coordinating uh, overall political coordinating mechanism. Uh, so Malcolm is going to delve into that. So this time he's going to provide an answer to his question. Uh, and he's also going to delve into some, uh, uh, um, you know, specific aspects. Uh, clearly the IMF has a ministerial committee. So how can this ministerial committee of the IMF can be reformed to, uh, so that uh, the G20 and the IMFC can, can work better? And then within the FSB, there is a plurality of governance actors, central banks, national regulators, uh, finance ministries, uh, uh, standard setting bodies. Each of them has its own agenda. And uh, clearly the interaction you know, among all these actors is becoming increasingly complex, if uh, it has ever been simple. So uh, thank goodness I have a lot only to introduce you. I don't have to uh, respond to these questions. So I'm going to give you the floor, Malcolm. And again, uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Well, thanks, Domenico. It's a great pleasure to be here and to have the uh, privilege of uh, sitting in on the, uh, the, uh, the, the two panels this morning, which I found absolutely uh, fascinating. As Domenico said, the title of my talk is Calm and Crisis in Global Finance. And I think this really does dovetail, dovetail with the general theme of this conference, Managing Global Commons. Many years ago now, I was a student uh, 
at, when I was a student at university, I attended the lectures of Professor Carl Holliner. And uh, Professor Carl Holliner was one of the world's most renowned authorities on agriculture in Europe in the later Middle Ages. And I learned from Carl Holliner how profound the time-honored saying that common land is no man's land really is. As we all know, in the Middle Ages, substantial amounts of land were, um, were reserved for the common use of the peasants and the serfs uh, on, in estates and villages. And of course, since no one owned common lands, they were inevitably overexploited. And that gave rise to failures of coordination and governance that resulted in alternating periods of calm and crisis, feast and famine throughout Europe that lasted for centuries. And as we actually saw this morning, particularly in the first discussion, the problems we're facing today in managing global commons are every bit analogous to those agricultural problems of, uh, of, of Europe in the late Middle Ages, but on a vastly larger scale. So today I do want to reflect a little bit on the global financial crisis and what it's taught us in terms of altering the governance of international cooperation in macroeconomic policy and particularly financial regulatory policy. And I want to start with two lessons that I think the financial crisis taught us and which are, I think, the two lessons that are most important from the narrow perspective of governance of, uh, in these areas, macroeconomic policy, co coordination, and financial regulatory uh, policy. So I'm not, there are many lessons we could take. The first lesson is that a financial system-wide crisis, such as the one that began in actually in August of 2007, but reached its near, near meltdown stage in the final four months of 2008, that sort of crisis is likely to cause much more severe and much more prolonged recessions than the usual macroeconomic triggers of the end of an investment boom or a jump in commodity prices or the central bank taking away the punch bowl from an over exuberant, exuberant um, uh, surge in domestic demand. So financial crises cause severe and prolonged macroeconomic recessions. Second lesson is that um, the recent uh, financial crisis was in large measure the result of major inconsistencies across different financial regulatory regimes. And that permitted financial risk management to move to those areas uh, wherever they were, and they weren't always in uh, developing countries and e EMEs, as we know, to move to those areas where they were least re regulated, where they were in the shadows, and where they were not controlled. And that means that financial regulatory reform, and I referred to this in my question, has to be, the main features of it, have to be uh, internationally harmonized. And of course, the world woke up to these lessons uh, in, uh, towards the end of 2008. And in mid-November, as we all know, after a year of drift, the political leaders of the G20 uh, met for the first time. And they took the initiative to fundamentally uh, transform the governance uh, arrangements for international coordination of both macroeconomic policy and financial regulatory rules. And the G20 DC uh, summit laid out, if we go just in the financial regulatory area, it laid out what I've always considered to be an astonishingly detailed program for the global architecture of financial regulation. And it established a highly ambitious timetable for its implementation. Actually, they picked up a report which had been prepared by a working group of the Financial Stability Forum, which I was a member of, which had been presented to the uh, finance ministers of the G7 in, 
let's call it G7, G7 slash G8 in April of 2008. And I think that's why, one reason why this, this program was so much more detailed and coherent than would typically have been the case for a hastily called summit like that. Well, it, almost six years later, we know that that program and the internationally coordinated uh, fiscal stimulus that was for, foreseen have not been all that was hoped for at the time. But I think, nevertheless, that in retrospect, it's clear that whatever their weaknesses, these policy initiatives really were major achievements of the new G20 governance structure for cooperation in these two areas of economic policy. Now, as Domenico has mentioned, those areas, uh, the, 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 the triad of um, policy implementation includes the G20 leaders, which is a self-selected group. It includes the, um, the universal treaty-based bodies like the IMF, the Bank for International Settlements, the World Bank, the International Standard Setters, and so on. And then it, it includes the Financial Stability Board, which we do have to remember is a body that was created by fiat by the G20 out of the Financial Stability Forum. Now, I think there are two really important improvements in the governance of uh, international economic policy coordination here. The first, of course, is just the initiation of the G20 leaders summits themselves because compared with the G7, G8, the G20 is uh, superior as an executive decision-making body because it includes a number of the key systemically important emerging market economies as well as the advanced economies. And therefore, it represents a much broader spectrum of global economic interests and a much larger share of global GDP than any of the previous uh, Gs. Now, that's not to say that its governance can't uh, be improved, and I'll come back to that in a minute. The second, I think, is that the IMF really has made major enhancements to its operations. And for me, what's most important in that is that the IMF has recognized that because financial system uh, crises cause severe and prolonged uh, recessions, the IMF must profoundly strengthen its analysis of financial systems in order to see the vulnerabilities that could lead to non-achievement of its major goal, which is a macroeconomic goal which is preserving and sustaining strong, non-inflationary, long-run economic growth. So the question is, do these innovations in the international coordination of policies contain possible lessons for strengthening the governance of cooperations, of cooperation in other um, global commons, other areas such as managing climate change, controlling terrorism, uh, uh, chasing uh, oppressive political regimes, and so on. And the relevant point here, I think, is the effectiveness of what uh, Domenico referred to, which I call the bimodal structure of the G20's interaction with this group of treaty-based international institutions, the IMF, the BIS, the World Bank, as well as its interaction with the FSB, in the governance of international cooperation in the economic and financial field. And I think this bimodal structure of policy coordination has proved to be particularly effective in times of crisis, and I think there's a reason for that. The reason is, as I see it, that global finance is highly complex. It evolves over time in response to unanticipated market developments, but also to unexpected and sometimes very rapid innovations in the market structure and institutional structure that alter the behavior of the financial system profoundly and sometimes very abruptly. And these characteristics make the behavior of the global financial system highly nonlinear. <clears throat> 
it can suddenly move far away from the steady state that the policymakers would like to be uh, would like it to be at. So the question is, what are the what are the government the governance arrangements that can manage a highly complex system that's in a state of continuous evolution? And actually, I think there is. This may sound a little bit geeky, but let me try. I think there is an analogy here with the basic principles of optimal control theory, the theory of how, what levers you have to pull to keep a complex dynamic system sort of near uh, its steady state, if it has a steady state. And a basic principle of optimal control is that in order to manage a, a dynamic system, you need at a minimum, as a necessary condition, two separate control levers. One control lever is operated by the, what, what I call the systemic controller. And that systemic controller, call it the IMF, um, alters policies or encourages policies to be uh, altered according to how far the system is away from its desired steady state. That's the systemic controller. The other crucial element, though, is the executive controller. The executive controller can take the additional uh, high-level strategic policy decisions that are needed if the system's not only a long way from where it should be, but moving in the wrong direction, which is a little bit like what we had in the fourth quarter of 2008. So I would submit to you that in the current structure of economic and financial policy coordination, the G20 is the executive controller that can change the stance of policies in conditions where we run into a serious unforeseen problem. Whereas the IMF, the BIS, the World Bank, the international standard setters can give advice that will be useful to countries in improving their performance in more normal uh, in more normal times. So that bimodal structure, I believe, is con actually consistent, at least by analogy and hand waving, with um, with uh, optimal control theory, and is really a point worth thinking about. So the sudden emergence of the G20 leader summits as the, uh, as the executive controller, I think, proved to be particularly important in managing the financial crisis and the Great Recession. And the issue now is mandate creep, loss of momentum in that body. And I think it's at least worth considering whether such a bimodal structure of governance, whatever institutions use to develop it, would also improve performance in other global commons areas, like the ones I've mentioned of climate change, um, terror, control of terrorism, uh, and, and uh, addressing natural disasters. So I think that's a, a very uh, worthwhile kind of conjecture that I would commend to you for further thought. Let me close by just uh, mentioning two elements that uh, Domenico referred to, which is that um, I believe there are two major areas where governance of international economic and financial uh, policy coordination need to be enhanced further, and it needs to be done soon. And the first is the one I alluded to in, in, uh, in the, 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 the second session this morning, and that is that the international community has not granted any institution a mandate to oversee the international financial system. Um, I have to declare an interest here. I'm the former general manager of the BIS, as Domenico said. I believe that the BIS has the expertise to do this. I believe there should be a separation of authority between whoever oversees the system and whoever judges whether um, the principles uh, and the best practices are being followed. I think that division would be a good idea. However, we have to recognize that the BIS, well, its successive general managers have expanded its membership a lot over the past 15 years, is not a universal institution. 
like the fund. And so uh, given that, it, I, I guess it looks like the fund is the logical candidate to be granted by the community uh, clearly the mandate which it sort of says it already has but doesn't have. And when you say you have a mandate to do something and you don't have the authority to do it, that's bureaucratic overreach and that's more dangerous than not having the, uh, the authority at all. The, fin the second key issue is, uh, of course, the weakness in the setup of the G20 itself. Uh, it's certainly superior to um, the earlier, more restricted Gs, all of them, G7, G10, G5, G1, et cetera. Um, but it's still a narrow, self-selected group. Its members don't have any responsibility to represent uh, in their decisions uh, the, uh, the countries uh, that are not at the table. There is no clear process for changing the composition of the G20 over the long term as uh, the economic weights of countries uh, change uh, or to rotate membership so that a broader spectrum of the international, um, of, of international leaders could have a role in the process. And so I would argue and, I, and others have argued that one way to address this might be to merge the IMFC, the International Monetary and Financial Committee, governing body of the IMF with the G20 so that it's subject to these responsibilities to the uh, countries that don't have their noses inside the tent. So those are my comments. I'd just like to thank you for your attention and hope they're a little bit thoughtful in preparation for your main course. Thank you. Malcolm has said he'll gladly take some questions. It won't hold up the food service. Just you know, we're going to bring in the, the lunch now, so don't feel bad about asking questions. There is a microphone there, and also we'll bring it around to people if it's a handheld that comes out. So if, if people like, we can also bring it to your table. Stuart, you're eager. Why don't you start? That, is, is that on right now? It's on. Okay, great. Um, uh, Stuart Patrick, um, thank you very much. I, I think you, um, I was very interested in, uh, towards the end of your um, talk, where you put your finger on what would appear to, to be a stumbling block that um, both for the G20 and its relationship to uh, these other more universal, um, often treaty-based bodies, um, and, uh, and other sort of analogies. For instance, um, uh, the work of the Major Economies Forum vis-a-vis uh, -vis the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, the Nuclear Security Group versus um, the, uh, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Regime, which is the fact that um, how, how does one relate um, an executive in this bimodal uh, view that you have, how, how does one um, relate the sort of executive <laughs> function of that group uh, with um, the sort of systemic um, the role that is supposed to be played by that organization? In the case of the UN, the United Nations, which is, of, of course, a cha charter body, you have you know, the duly constituted UN Security Council, which uh, for certain purposes acts as the executive group, but then, of course, it has a grounding in international law. And, um, I'd be interested in it, it, just with your your, your uh, example of the um, potential the G20 membership in the IFC. Um, I mean, the IMFC. Uh, what would be um, would you would would that um, merging look like a um, G20 model going to the IMFC or a constituency based um, approach uh, that is used by the international financial institutions? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, great question. First of all, in terms of the bimodal uh, uh, control system, there's, there's a crucial element that works really well in economics, and that is that the executive group should be using the same information set that is gathered by the universal systemic institution. They're both reading from the same hymn book, if you like in terms of understanding where the economies are. And that is why it's absolutely crucial that the fund has, under its authority, in the Articles of Agreement, the um, ability to require countries to provide information to it in the macroeconomic sphere. And in fact, 
although they're never used, there are sanctions against countries. For example, they couldn't borrow from the fund if they were not prepared to accept an Article IV mission and provide the information. But that's not true if you ask the, um, the, the head national regulator of a country that hosts a financial institution that's so large it has activities all over the world. So this is the problem I'm alluding to. Now, um, and so I think there's a, there should be a symbiotic relationship between the executive controller and the systemic controller. And I do believe that, in effect, that's a little bit there because the IMF and the FSB uh, brief the finance ministers of the IMFC and the membership of the IMFC is really uh, pretty much the same as that of the G20. So to get to your second point, the issue is the constituencies. It is the fact that in the IMFC and in the Funds Executive Board, whatever its problems of representation, everybody who has a seat theoretically is responsible to also represent the interests of those in its constituency who aren't there. And that's really crucial. And the final point I would make is that this is very different very, very different from the situation in the UN where we have the whole group and the General Assembly, Assembly and then we have the Security Council because in the Security Council there is a veto and that means that what everybody but one wants to do can be vetoed by one permanent member. And that is not the kind of structure that, that would be effective in this in, in this bimodal view. So what I'm talking about is just generic, but I think it is a principle of, that you know, is worth looking at and trying to see how these other things should be organized. So three questions lined up at the back. Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, in terms of um, systemic and executive controls, the impression I got from your submission is that the two types <coughs> of control can exist independently of the other. Whereas, I want to believe that it is very possible to still have the two, you know, coexist for greater effective, um, you know, uh, management. Um, I don't know whether you can clarify um, this. I think the two have to go pari passu. Um, the second question uh, arises from your suggestion that um, the G20 can be merged with uh, the IMF. Uh, I want to find out if you have reckoned, taking into account, uh, what will be the perception of, say, the third world countries, the African countries, where you now have a merger of a G20 with one of these uh, Bruton Woods institutions. Because the, uh, we are likely to be faced with uh, um, unforeseen problems that will arise from the perception, bearing in mind uh, the situational reality as it is today. Thank you. Thank you. On your first question, I totally agree with you. The, 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 uh, the two elements of control have to be working together. And there's nothing that prevents, in fact, it, I would encourage the systemic controller to give advice to the executive controller on what, policy, um, uh, what policies are going to be effective in a crisis situation. The point is simply that the systemic controller is not, is not at a high enough level to take executive strategic decisions that deviate hugely from past practice. So I totally agree with you on the first point. On the question of the perception of um, merging the G20 and the IMFC, I believe that if uh, this merge occurred in a situation which made it clear that all countries would be re represented by some member of that more restricted group, that the, uh, the um, decision on who would be in that group over time would be based on a clear set of rules. And maybe there was some rotation of, uh, of some seats that it would be 
uh, much more positively received than the G20 itself has been. Um, Malcolm, I have a, <clears throat> on your proposal, I have a, you know, a comment and a question. The comment is that introducing the constituency-based representation is um, a great plus because it would embed the dynamic approach into the membership of the G20 because clearly you, know, you would have uh, countries whose uh, uh, weight in the world economy rise, rises over time that would uh, maybe chair their own constituency. This is a very slow process but still it is much faster than any uh, amendment in the composition of the G7, which has never occurred in practice. Uh, so this is uh, a first plus. The second is that depending on how you configure uh, your um, you know, G20 plus IMF committee, you provide uh, for uh, African representation. Uh, however, the, you know, the question I have is that uh, you know, if we look at the G20 uh, Finance Ministers Forum, uh, it is true that it uh, deals with issues uh, related to international macroeconomic cooperation, international financial regulation. So these are closer, you know, if uh, they not uh, overlap completely with the IMF mandate. However, they also, you know, they have a dual role insofar as they also focus on preparing the summit for their own leaders. So how would you strike you know, this tension, this dual role, which is currently embedded in the G20 finance ministers as we know it? Yeah, I think you could argue that one of the weaknesses of what I'm throwing out here, let's not call it a proposal, but what I'm throwing out here is that it, it pushes down the, um, the G20 role or the role of the restricted ex ex executive group back down to the finance ministers again instead of the leaders. But I think, you know, in, in your question is, is really the kernels of an answer to that. And that is that the finance ministers are sort of the, they're the conduit between the systemic controller and the executive controller. They're briefed by a combination of the FSB and the IMF in their meetings. Uh, if you ask even IMF staff members whether the briefing goes to the IMFC or the G20, they, they can't really tell you. It's, it's not. So this is exactly, the, I think, the right way to move this forward. But uh, it is, I think, quite important that the finance ministers really do stick to addressing economic and financial issues and not to... Uh, engage in mandate creep, which I think is not a serious risk. Uh, Malcolm, uh, terrific presentation, and uh, I liked your exhortation to uh, think of how the model might travel into other governance sectors. As uh, you may know, and certainly some of the people in this room know, CG's involved in a major exercise in, uh, in governance, uh, and that has to do with the internet, uh, where uh, the chief sponsor for something called the Global Commission on Internet Governance, which is uh, looking at uh, governance challenges uh, to, uh, to manage the Internet Commons, uh, a term that uh, I use cautiously. Um, and your, your, your two principles, uh, in some ways, uh, could be used to characterize that system. Uh, as it stands now, uh, the system controller is uh, an organization called ICANN, the Internet Corporation right. for Assigned Names and Numbers, and the um, the executive function is currently managed by the uh, U.S. Department of Commerce. And as you know, a decision was made by the Obama administration to uh, essentially relinquish that authority, provided <laughs> five conditions can be met. And the real challenge there, uh, and Gordon, feel free to jump in and save me as I get into, uh, uh, into this area. But uh, you know, very simply, um, one of the, the challenges in, uh, in relinquishing that executive function is who will take it up. And you have uh, the mobilized voices of civil society, not just in the United States, but elsewhere, who are champions of something called multi-stakeholder governance, which uh, really refers to governance arrangements that involve governments, 
private actors and non-governmental organizations uh, where uh, issues of accountability, legitimacy, uh, democracy uh, are very much at the forefront of uh, concerns about governance arrangements. And what strikes me in your presentation is that it's very hard to have the kind of executive management control systems that you identify uh, as they apply in the financial area in discussions about reform when it comes to the internet. And, uh, you know, my question is, I understand your exhortation, but in a world where uh, citizens are mobilized, uh, it's very hard to sell uh, uh, executive management of the kind that you characterize to deal with, you know, what I would call sort of major crisis management in a system. Yes. Um, I totally agree with you. I, I think your characterization of the the problem of governance in the in the internet space is uh, is, is is very very uh, uh, pungent with uh, with significance. Um, and I think that when I reflect on it, that's the area where it would be the most difficult to apply the kind of principles I'm talking about. I think it's much easier in uh, control of terrorism and responding to natural disasters and so on than it is in the internet space. And there's a very simple reason for that. And that is that in those other areas, you know who, are the, who can and should be the actors, the executive uh, controllers who have the power to do things and the capabilities. And that's not true in the internet space. So I think it, it is a, it's at another level of difficulty. That, because of all the different players, and they do have a legitimate interest in what, it, what is happening on this network. We all do. Uh, that said, the principle of bimodal control still, I believe, probably, at least by analogy, is a relevant one. That's all I would say. Great. Well, I'd like to uh, say thank you to Malcolm for, for going uh, his, uh, his lunch, at least part of it, um, to uh, bring us all this interesting idea of bimodal control of executive and systemic control of uh, areas of the global commons. He started out by saying, quoting Carl Heiner, saying the common land is no man's land. He presented a point of view where it could be multiple persons' lands. Um, and uh, we thank you for your interventions today, and please do enjoy your lunch now. Thank you very much.